Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invite. It is very nice to talk to you this afternoon and to all the guest participants. Um, uh, I, I'm absolutely amazed to see how quickly this new technology has taken over and how quickly everybody is working with this new technology. It's just, it is just amazing. There are so many of these webinar kind of software out there and everybody seems to know exactly how it works. Uh, so it just goes to show how quickly things can change if you need to change certain things. So my name is Davi Lut. I'm the economist at the Efficient Group. And my email address will be available on the screen. You can, if you want to send me an email, you're more than welcome. And I can include you on my distribution list. I do write some articles. I do some research. And at the Efficient Group, uh, I'm an economist there. And the, the reason why they employ economists is to, and that's my job, is to help them and help our asset managers with the management of the assets of our clients locally and internationally. So whenever I look at the economy, I always try to keep that in the back of my mind. What should I do with the money of my clients? Uh, because uh, my clients, uh, it's important for me to make sure that they're in the right kind of assets, but it's also important for, my, for me to make sure that my clients make money. And in the current environment, that certainly is not very easy to do. And as you all know, the financial markets took a huge knock the last couple of weeks in the last two months or so. In fact, this is a completely different world in which we find ourselves today. So I'm gonna start my talk by just uh, starting off with where we were just before the crisis, before Corona, let's call it BC, before Corona. And it started not that long ago. Let's go back to perhaps November or December last year and the South African economy was in a recession already. We've already had two subsequent quarters of negative economic growth and that is a so-called technical recession. Internationally, there were a couple of things that were very, very important and very interesting in a way for economists at least. And that is that <coughs> debt levels of governments internationally were, and currently are even higher, at the record high level. So governments owe a lot of money internationally. A second thing that is also uh, something quite unusual about the international economy is that monetary policy internationally are exceptionally accommodative. With that, what I mean is that central banks are trying to make life as easy as absolutely possible for just about everybody and that's why central banks internationally have cut interest rates down uh, to very low levels and in many instances central banks have reduced interest rates to below zero and not only that central banks are also experimenting with all sort of funny things uh, things with names like, like for example quantitative easing and so on which results in uh, this weird situation that if you want to lend money to the German government, as an example, you have to pay them before they take your money. But that's the kind of situation, the world situation. And now all of a sudden, we have this new thing coming from, from a city that I've never heard of. And this thing is called a, a virus, a coronavirus, a round virus. And this thing, uh, the result of that is that the, the third of the world's population is currently in lockdown. That, of course, will have a huge impact on the world economy. At the moment, uh, I expect the economic growth globally to be minus 3%, maybe even minus 4%. That is global growth, the world economic growth. And just about all the economies in the world are currently going through a recession and quite an, an extended and a, quite a deep recession as well. Even those economies uh, that has been growing for forever and a day, like for example, the, the Indians and the Chinese, even they, their economic growth will also be significantly lower and there's even a possibility that some of those economies will dip into a recession as well. So that's where, where we were before the crisis. And maybe just a few comments about South Africa. Remember, this is not a new crisis. This is simply a crisis on top of a crisis. We're, we were, in fact, in a crisis in South Africa. The fiscal accounts, that's what the Minister of Finance is res responsible for, were uh, the completely unsustainable trajectory state debt levels were at record high levels and increasing at an alarming rate. The fiscal deficit, the fiscal deficit is the amount of money that the politicians every, every month and every year borrow in order to balance the book of the, of the state. The fiscal deficit has been set before the crisis at 6.8% of GDP. Uh, and now we have this crisis and I can promise you everything is gonna go uh, from, from really bad to horribly bad in South Africa. No, let me repeat this. We were already in a recession. The fiscal accounts were already mismanaged and the state-owned enterprises were already uh, operationally and financially have already been driven into the ground. I'm referring to ESCOM, South African Airways and the like. And now it is the virus. Now, I must tell you, I agree with the president uh, with his initial decision. 
But now, of course, it's easy to go back uh, with, the, with the benefit of hindsight and criticize the president, perhaps. But at that stage, we were all new to this. The president followed best international practice at that stage. He was advised to lock the, the economy down the way that he did. And what I liked about the president, he was acting real presidential. And he's, he's Minister of Health, equally so. The Minister of Health was very, and still is, very transparent on what is going on. And uh, clearly, they have a plan. Clearly, they are our political leaders. And clearly, they should be respected for the way that they manage the crisis, um, and still do, to a large extent. So yes, the right decision by the president, at least at that time, but subsequently, the decision by the president to, pro, to, to extend the lockdown, I'm not so sure I agree with that anymore. And in fact, I've done some calculations myself, and I would like to share some of these calculations with you, because I believe the lockdown is passed its sell-by date, and that from now on, the damage to the economy will be far, far worse than the potential benefits that we can get from locking down the economy. Now, here are some, some estimates of my some of the calculations that I have conducted. Now, let me just make the comment that the single biggest killer in the world, the single biggest killer that killed more than malaria and cancer and all sort of other pestilence and illnesses, all of those together, the single biggest killer in the world is poverty. Poverty kills more people in the world than all those other bad things put together. And with poverty, I don't necessarily mean hunger. That is wrong. But poverty is much broader than just people being hungry. Poverty also means that you don't have proper infrastructure. Poverty means that you have inferior health services, that you have inferior education, that you have a lot of crime in poor countries. And in fact, everything that correlates with things that are bad uh, correlates with poverty. Poverty is bad, and the opposite of poverty is wealth. Wealth is good, and everything that's good correlates with wealth. People live much longer in wealthy countries. Health services are good. Education services are good. Crime levels are low. Wealth is a good thing. Now, the average life expectancy in South Africa is approximately 60 years, while the life, average life expectancy in European countries, as an example, is more than 80 years. The average European is three times wealthier than the average South African. And, and the, the gap, that 20 years gap, is the price, is how poverty is killing South Africans before the time. So we, all of us, on average, will lose 20 years because of poverty. And you can find that in many other countries in the world. Now, I have calculated, and I used some data, I looked at the, the Greek data, for example, that because of the increase in poverty, in South Africa over the next 10 years, and there will be a, a huge increase in poverty. We will lose approximately 300 lives over the next 10 years. So poverty is gonna kill a couple of hundred thousand people uh, in South Africa, 300,000 lives, according to my calculations. Now, I don't know how many people are gonna die from this virus. I've uh, looked at many estimates. I've looked at many actual numbers, and I must tell you, not a single one of those estimates get close to how many people will die from poverty. And for that reason, I believe that we must open up this economy as soon as we absolutely can. We have to open up this economy and the approach should be not to close everything down and open certain things. The approach must be to open everything and close certain things. Like, for instance, old age homes, it makes sense, close that down. Or, for example, prohibit the gathering of, of people for, for, for uh, sporting events and things like that, as an example. But you cannot close down this economy. People are going to die from poverty. And in fact, it really touches me personally because where I live, people are walking in the streets, they are begging for food. I've never seen so much hardship in this country than what I am seeing today, and it's going to get worse. And I cannot see how this lockdown can be extended in any practical manner because people are simply start, will simply ignore this lockdown from now on. We must open up this economy. Let me give you some other estimates on, uh, on some economic numbers that I've calculated. Now, the economy, like I've mentioned, was already in a recession. The economy was already contracting. We were in, already in a crisis. That crisis will be prolonged now and I looked up this morning the difference between the word recession and the word depression. And South Africa is basically in a depression. In fact, the average South African 
has been getting poorer every year for the past five years. So it's not even something that started years, yes, last year. It's been going on for a number of years. So we have been getting poorer gradually for the last five years. And this year, the economy is likely to contract and all these numbers will change every day, of course, as we get more information. So take all the numbers I'm going to give you uh, with, a, with a, a pinch of salt and accept and assume that the numbers are probably going to be worse than what I'm going to mention now. But my estimates suggest that the economy can contract by, by roughly about 8%, it may even be 10% for 2020. We're talking about a prolonged and a very, very deep recession in South Africa. This is a depression. The unemployment levels currently in South Africa, or BC before Corona, was nearly 30%. We're going to see a 7% relative to GDP increase or relative to the population increase in, in unemployment in South Africa. We're going to see unemployment at around about 36-37% uh, by the end of this year. That means an, an additional 2 million people are going to lose their jobs in South Africa. The South African economy, uh, to get through this, the South African economy will take years uh, to get back where it was previously. Yes, it's probably going to take us the best part of 10 years. And remember, an, an economy is not like a light switch. We can't switch it on and off. We can't just stop the lockdown and, it's, and we're back to business again. An economy is like a tree. It grows like a tree with rings. And if you cut the tree down, you will see by looking at the rings, which ones of those years were the years where the, that tree suffered a drought, as an example. And this is a, a horrible drought that the South African economy is going through. And the scars of this year, and in fact, of the last couple of years, will be with the South African economy for many, many years to come. A few other numbers. So expect economic growth of minus 8%. But remember, the state itself is very much dependent on the economy because they need to fund a lot of things. They need to fund the state on enterprises, which has been mostly wasted the last couple of years. They have to fund a, an army of civil servants there are too many of them, and most of them are overpaid. We have to pay that. Not only that, there are also 18 million people receiving grants from the state. And unfortunately, because of the economy that is slowing down, state revenue is also going to be substantially lower than the original budgeted estimates. At this stage, I expect the state revenue to be about 200 billion or even 300 billion less than the original budgeted estimates. We're talking big numbers here, people. We're talking really, really big numbers here. So originally, the Minister of Finance said that the fiscal deficit will be equal to just under 7% under of GDP, but state revenue is going to collapse. That will push it up to about 10% of GDP. And in the meantime, the Minister of Finance announced, uh, and the President announced a number of measures that were put in place and are being put in place to support the South African economy, a so-called rescue package to support the South African economy. And let me unpack that a little bit because I think it's important to understand what the announcements were. Now, according to the president and the minister of finance, they announced that a package of 500 billion rand will be spent or used, it was announced to support the South African economy. Now, this 500 billion rand consists of the following. 200 billion rand of that will be an additional guarantee that will be given to banks uh, and that money will be made available to banks in the form of a guarantee. So the banks don't get money as such. They get a guarantee. And the Reserve Bank is also in on this deal. So the banks get a guarantee. And the idea is for the banks to lend out money uh, to companies that have been affected by, by the virus. And of course, there are certain criteria in terms of uh, uh, turnover and the like. So that money hasn't been spent. It's simply a guarantee. And if those loans should go sour, then this money... Uh, then, then, of course, the taxpayer will have to stand in for those loans because it is a guarantee. But the money has not yet been spent. That's, so that's the biggest chunk of this 500 billion, 200 billion by way of a guarantee. Another 100 billion will be used to save jobs and to create jobs. Now, again, that's nothing new, really, because the biggest chunk of that probably going to come from the unemployment, unemployment insurance fund. Between 30 and 60 billion rand, we don't really know because the, we need a lot of information on that. But yes, it's probably a couple of billion will be spent extra on job creation or job uh, protection, which I believe is not the right thing to do, by the way. But there's some money will be spent uh, on that as well. And they're talking about 100 billion, but it's not a full 100 billion, of course. Then there are some other measures that were announced, like, for example, certain tax measures to the tune of approximately 170 billion rand or so, which, of course, is not really a tax uh, uh, a break. All it is, is a postponement of certain taxes. Yes, there will be a bit of a tax break, 
but that bulk of these taxes, you will still have to pay that. And anyway, the taxpayer will have to pay all these taxes going forward. But, but the, uh, these taxes, the idea is that you get a bit of a break to improve your cash flow and go and see uh, about those uh, different opportunities on the various taxes that are there that you can use to assist your business with your tax flow. But essentially what's going to happen, uh, tax flow wise, you will be better off over the next like, four months or so, but thereafter, you will have to start repaying these taxes. So theoretically, for the full financial year, the Minister of Finance is going to get all these taxes anyway. Which, of course, is not going to happen for various reasons, but that's the idea. It's not, there's no real tax break. Then there were some other announcements in this 500 billion package, like for instance, a 20 billion rand that will probably be borrowed from, a, from inter, some international organization, and maybe we can talk about that a bit later, and that will be used to import certain medical supplies. Uh, and then there's another 20 billion that will be given to the local authorities, and these local authorities are supposed to use this 20 billion to support for water expenses and housing, and the like to, of course, to, serve, to support especially the very poor. Unfortunately, most of the local authorities are mismanaged in any event. So that 20 billion will probably be wasted as well. And then one or two other announcements that I think are worth mentioning. One is that the, the president announced a, a quite a, a significant increase in the various grants. Uh, the child support grant will go up by 500 uh, rand per month. And uh, some of the other grants will go up as well. And a new grant was introduced, and let's call it the basic income grant. And that's the idea for that is a grant to people that are not captured in some sort of other uh, social safety net. And they will get 350 Rand per month, uh, which is not much. But of course, that's the first time that we will have a, a very, very wide support net for people that, not, that are not assisted some, somewhere else. Now, this total additional spending on the various grants will cost us, according to the minister, approximately an additional 50 billion rand. We're talking big money here, people, 50 billion rand. And the idea is that after a couple of months, then the grants will be reduced again to their original levels. Now, I'm afraid that's not going to happen. That's simply not going to happen because there's no way that you're going to give poor people money and then decide you're going to take this money back. So people are simply not going to stand for that. So I'm afraid this will become a permanent fixture and we also have to remember that some political parties were lobbying for a basic income grant. So that's, they've got it now. So we will have a basic income grant from now on, because once you start spending money, let, let me rephrase that. Milton Friedman, a well-known economist, he said once, there's nothing as permanent as a temporary state expense, uh, expense project. And this is exactly what it is. It's going to become permanent. Now, if you add all these additional state spending together, we're talking about probably in the region of about 200 billion or so extra spending from the state, and that will also be added to the fiscal deficit. We are pushing the fiscal de deficit up another, say, 2% or so to around 12% or maybe even 13% of GDP. In the meantime, the economy is going to contract by 8%, as I've mentioned, and because this fiscal deficit is always expressed as a percentage of the economy, as a percentage of GDP, the ratio is likely not going to be 6.8% like we previously budgeted, it's not going to be 10%, or it's going to be 12 or 13%. This new ratio is probably going to be in the region of about 15. 15% to GDP. That's the new borrowing that the Minister of Finance will have to conduct in the current financial year just to balance the books. And there's no wonder that Moody's downgraded us uh, because it was already, we were already in trouble. Now we're going to borrow another, at least maybe as much, even as 20% of GDP in one single year. It's the amount of money that the Minister of Finance is going to borrow. Before this virus, we were already heading for, for, for state debt levels of around about 70% of GDP. Now, because of this, uh, uh, the new situation in which we are in, state debt as a percentage of GDP will exceed 80% of GDP within the next year. And that excludes the guarantees to ESCOM, to South African Airways, and all those other parasitals. And maybe I should just make, uh, mention something about exactly that. The, um, listening to the Minister of Finance when he dis discussed his package, the 500 billion last week, he made a couple of comments, off-script comments, and quite often you learn more from listening to the politicians when they're off script than reading through the official statements. And here are some of the comments that he did make. Now, remember, Titi Mouweni is probably the best minister of finance the ANC can offer. He was the guy that I really hoped that he's going to bring some sanity to some really 
wrong decisions that were taken in the past. And he did. In fact, this is exactly what he's done. When he was uh, not too long ago, the, pre the Minister of Finance, he said a couple of times that we have to get rid of the state-owned enterprises, we have to cut back on the wage bill. And he said these things that we all know. He was, he was this lone voice in the wilderness. Now, our Minister of Finance, he made off-the-cuff comments about things like, for example, that South African Airways will uh, will be revived from the ashes of the old South African Airways. Now, I couldn't believe my ears. Tito Mbaweni, our Minister of Finance, a guy that understands finance, all of a sudden, where he was completely opposed to the state being the owner of an airline, suddenly propagates the idea of a new airline that is state-owned. Tito Mbaweni also mentioned some other things that I'm very concerned about. I wonder what happened to him. You also mentioned things like, for example, in now in the future, if you have a, a business, a spa shop or a restaurant, then you, you have to prove that you are employing South Africans before you will be allowed to operate. You have to have a bank uh, account, as an example. Those sort of comments that you make, and that sounds a bit xenophobic to me. He did say, this is not xenophobia, but then what is it? He also mentioned that they're going to start all sort of projects after uh, the virus, once the lockdown has been over. Projects like, for example, a new committee that will identify land and use this land and give it to people that can follow it, produce uh, food. So politicians will get more involved in that sort of thing. He's talking about residential areas, development, and how we're going to grow this economy. Clearly, what, the minister, what our Minister of Finance is thinking is that the state is going to get more involved in more things. And we know the success record of this government when they get involved in all sorts of things. So I'm afraid what we are heading for is more political interference, more political meddling in the economy. And believe me, the politicians and the bureaucrats have a lot of power uh, because of this lockdown. They can literally tell us whether we can buy hot food or not. They can tell us whether we can smoke or not, we can drink or not. Those are the kind of powers that the politicians have assumed for themselves. And believe me, once you give powers to a bureaucrat, they never give it back. And it's going to be extremely difficult for us to, to return to life as normal. That will, it will never be normal again. So what we have is a state that is throwing this net of state interference wider over the South African economy in the future. And because they are so very in inefficient, this net has got more and more holes in it. And that's what's concerning. Because these holes, these vacuums, will be filled by other things. Because the state simply can't get to everything. And these vacuums will be filled by things like, for example, cigarette or uh, uh, illegal cigarette uh, businesses, smugglers, that use this opportunity that to expand their business. Because we're not allowed to buy cigarettes uh, legally. So where do you buy it? You buy it illegally. And this is the chance for the illegal, for the syndicates to establish their business. So that's another, another void, another vacuum that will be full. The same goes for alcohol, as an example. And that's also, in a way, an opportunity for civil organizations to fill some of these vacuums that will be left by the, a bigger state, but still a very and a highly inefficient and incompetent state. One other two things that I think is worth mentioning as well. One is the Reserve Bank, some announcements by the South African Reserve Bank. The Reserve Bank announced um, uh, from the monetary policies, uh, from a monetary po uh, authority, certain measures to support the South African economy. And some background is very important. The one is, is that the South African Reserve Bank has been managed very conservatively in the past. Lesetje Kanyahu, the governor, has been a very conservative central banker. He's kept interest rates relatively high, when many analysts, economists, and politicians have been criticizing him for that. Fortunately, I was not one of those. I was always in favor of keeping interest rates relatively high, and that's exactly what he's done. He has been a conservative central bank, which was the right thing to do, because now that we are in a real, real crisis, now that we really need all the help that we can get to support the economy, now the Reserve Bank has the capacity to really support the economy. Unlike what, uh, what would have been the situation if the Reserve Bank decided to cut interest rates the way that analysts uh, wanted to, or many analysts wanted to in the past, then we would have had interest rates at very low levels already, meaning that the Reserve Bank can't do more. But because interest rates were relatively high, 
we could cut interest rates and we've seen that substantial reduction in short-term interest rates by the Reserve Bank. In fact, I think over the next couple of months, and maybe even longer, we should see inflation coming down very, very sharply uh, for reasons like, for instance, very weak demand in the economy. So very weak demand, people are simply just not buying. If people are not buying, that pushes inflation lower, creating a further opportunity for the Reserve Bank to cut interest rates. So I think further interest rates cut is certainly possible. In the meantime, the international oil price has collapsed completely, and that will also push down inflation to lower levels. So further cuts in interest rates can be expected. Additionally, the Reserve Bank also made some amendment to certain capital and liquidity requirements of the banks. Basically, it comes down to, to banks being in a, an easier position, uh, making life a little bit easier for the banks, and that will allow the banks to make life a little bit easier for us. Uh, the clients of the bank in terms of um, the repayments of loans and the like. And then the third thing that the Reserve Bank did was to actively start getting involved in the capital market, especially government bond market, cap uh, government debt instrument market, where the Reserve Bank has actively started to buy government debt instruments in the secondary market. Now, I'm a little bit in two minds with that, if, whether that's the right thing to do. I think it's the right thing to do in the short term to make sure that there is sufficient liquidity but it's a very dangerous thing for a central bank to get involved in literally printing money and buying government debt instruments with that. So the test will be whether the Reserve Bank will be in a position to get out of that going forward. But of course, as always, there are amazing opportunities under these sort of circumstances. There's no doubt that we're going to go through a very, very difficult time. Huge increase in unemployment and poverty and everything that goes with that it's going to be hugely disruptive and that is usually goes with a lot of pain. We've seen these sort of things, not similar, but we've seen a, a volatile situations in South Africa that goes with pain. But during these situations or these times, there are also many opportunities to be had and here are some opportunities that I have identified. Remember for, before we've even heard of this virus, there were certain trends very much apparent uh, people simply put it under one heading, calling it the fourth industrial revolution. And all of a sudden, the fourth industrial revolution is all over us. Look at what we're doing at this moment. I'm talking to a lot of people uh, over a specific media. I haven't used this. This is the first time I'm using it. I only started using it a few weeks ago. And now everybody is doing it. And there are so many of them. This is the fourth industrial revolution. I've never been this busy. I'm at home. I'm fortunate. Uh, I'm, keeping my, I'm keeping my team busy. Our business is doing very well. Uh, unfortunately, for the wrong reasons, but our business is doing very, very well. And we are extremely, extremely busy. And that's what life is probably going to be in the future. Is that we're probably going to work more from home than, than what we're going to uh, going back to the ways to be used. That will have implications for things like, for example, um, uh, commercial property, office blocks, as an example. We already know that uh, the the internet businesses like for example take a lot and amazon they were they were doing very well and all of a sudden that's just about the only place where you can buy certain things and that's what people are doing so i think in future uh, the way that we're doing shopping is going to change it's going to change absolutely complete uh, and another very interesting thing that i've picked up in china even after they have opened up the parts of china that were What is very, very interesting, open up some areas in China after the lockdown in China, people didn't flock to the restaurants and didn't go back to retails, to shops all of a sudden, as most economists expected. No, in fact, they're still staying at home. So maybe that is the new normal. People are not going to go to shops anymore. And maybe the, 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 the way that we live our lives is going to change forever. Another interesting thing is chances are very good that in future we're not going to travel nearly as much as we used to travel just not too long ago. That is probably going to have an impact on the way that we live. Young people now, instead of going somewhere and only buying a very small apartment, may decide to buy a slightly bigger apartment, but with more comfort. But the possibility that in future, if you see families living together on one big property, and that, in a weird way, may actually support quite expensive properties. So that's the kind of situation that we're going to see in future. Things are going to change. But what I'm very concerned about is that we've 
we actually have under these circumstances a wonderful opportunity to fix some of the structural issues that we have in South Africa. This is the opportunity where we can really get rid of many of the state-owned enterprises. This is the opportunity uh, where we can restructure the fiscus, where we can get rid of many, many of civil servants. There are just many of them that are totally overpaid. This is the opportunity to restructure uh, ESCOM. It's not happening. I'm afraid uh, this is the, there are so many opportunities that we have at the moment, uh, but unfortunately, our political leaders are far more interested in their ideological ideas and they're far more interested in certain political and social uh, objectives than really in the future of the South African economy. We are probably going to see a split up in terms of the various communities in South Africa. I think local community life is going to become much more important and probably much stronger as well in future. This is what's happening to me. I know my neighbors all of a sudden. My neighbors and I, we work together with all sort of other people, uh, with other people trying to support people that are less fortunate than us, for example. And that's the kind of future that I expect that we're going to see. I also will not be surprised if we see in future that people will get really, I mean, if we don't see certain structural adjustments, uh, I'm concerned that we could see people really trying to cut back on their taxes, legally and illegally. And maybe even this could be the opportunity and the environment of new uh, uh, technologies that were only uh, the, uh, in an experimental phase in the past to really start making proper inroads. And I'm referring, for example, to private currencies as an example and so on. So where's all of this going to end? I just don't know. I think in the short term, what we should be concerned about is politicians dipping into the savings of the pensioners. I'm talking about prescribed assets for pension funds. I'm also concerned about eventually the introduction of foreign exchange regulations. Those are the kind of things that I will be keeping an eye out for. But my advice to people is make sure that you know what is going on. Make sure whatever industry you are, make sure that you can identify risks and you can manage those risks. And that includes having a proper budget to make sure that you have sufficient cash flow. Cash flow is what really matters now. And if you have investments, if you have a portfolio, make sure that the substantial part of your portfolio is invested abroad. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. That was just over just an half, half an hour or so. And if there are any questions, I will be more than happy to take those. Thank you very much, Davi. That was very informative. Um, I am sure that we have lots of questions from our participants. Um, yeah, so we would like to start our question and answer session now. Um, I would like to ask you um, to please uh, raise your hands if, uh, or hand, sorry, that's how it's called in Zoom if you would like to ask a question. So um, on the bottom of your window, you will find a place called participants. You can click on that and on, then a chat window will open on the right and you can raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Okay, there I am. Is there any question you would like to ask? Not yet. Can, um, I, can okay. I say something about? Can I say something about the loan from the IMF because I've read some everybody's lips. Okay, please, Davi. Yes. Yeah. All right, because I, I think that is probably what's, it's going to be one of the questions. What about an IMF loan? Um, remember, when you talk about an IMF loan or a loan from the World Bank or one of these international institutions. Uh, you usually get the money in the form of American dollars or maybe something else like special drawing rights or euros or whatever, but usually in the form of dollars. So when you talk about borrowing money from international institutions like the IMF or the World Bank, you must first ask yourself the question, what is it that they want to buy in dollars? What is it that they want to spend dollars on? Because that's the reason why you borrow international dollars. You can't use dollars in South Africa because we use rands in South Africa. We, uh, the, you have to import something with that or you have to pay off some existing other dollar loans or you can maybe use it to support your currency. But you can't use it in South Africa because we don't use dollars in South Africa. In fact, the South African Reserve Bank's got reserves in excess of $50 billion. So we have, the dollars is not our problem. 
Our problem is rands. We've got a shortage of rands in South Africa. In fact, uh, the Reserve Bank doesn't need dollars to make rands. They can, they've got a little machine called printing press. They can make as many rands as they wish. Mm. So for that reason, uh, there could be some loans from the IMF to import certain things like medical stuffs and so on. But don't think we can borrow money from the IMF to pay local salaries. That cannot happen. You, you borrow dollars because you want to pay something in dollars. All right, that is very informative. Okay. Um, uh, Darby, we've got the first, we have a question here, um, and that would be from Philip. Um, Philip, I'm going to unmute you now. Please ask your question for Darby. Thank you, uh, Maria. Darby, I just have one question. The, the picture that you have painted is not, not very rosy. Um, and as a businessman, I'm obviously very concerned about, about the picture you have painted. Now, my question is, well, uh, first a statement and then um, coming from that is obviously your comments. Um, I really thought the opportunity in, in this huge mess we have now is that the politicians will, will really move away from the ideological uh, approach to a more economic, capitalistic approach. And from, from what you're saying, that is not the case. Um, what are the options then, you know, if, if, if we don't go to a more stringent capitalistic approach, I don't see much of a future, to be quite honest with you. Um, are you sure that is what's going to happen? Uh, what is your opinion in, in respect of that? Yeah, Philip, thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, yes, you know, when we first heard about this, let me just give a bit of a, a, a political perspective. What is clear to me is that the president, like I've said, is acting presidential. What is clear to me is that the president really cemented his political support base. I think that everybody's talking about the president acting presidential and all that. We don't hear any more of, uh, of the Asian Magashules and some of these other funny people anymore. We, we mostly hear from the president. Of course, there are some of the, the ministers that I think are really, really misbehaving, and I'm referring to Zene and a couple of the other ones. But the president certainly is, and I think this was the opportunity for a president. I mean, when we first heard about the lockdown, and I mean, I started looking at the numbers, I realized that we are really in very deep trouble. And if you want to, you usually need a, a catalyst like this uh, to take very unpopular steps and to implement very unpopular things, like, for example, privatization and the like. So that's what I thought initially. And I agree with that's what I, and I still think the opportunity is there. Unfortunately, that's not what I hear. Unfortunately, what I hear is last week is Prabhim Gordon with the alliance partners to organize the labor, the Kusatu and the like, and they actually say that South African airways will be revived. I, I, I can't get my head around that. Even Tito Mboweni is supporting that. I cannot get my head around that. So my real concern is here, they are still, going on with the silly ideological ideas of socialism, of more intervention, or more prescriptions about in the South African. It hasn't worked in the past, but yet they keep on doing this. Now, I haven't heard the president go and opposing them or say, telling them that we're going to close South African airways. But the other senior ministers, Tito Mboweni and Pravin Borden, say that is what's going to happen, and a couple of other similar kind of things that they're saying going to happen. But you're quite, So that seems to be the... the what's going to happen? We're going to have more state interference. We're going to have a real command economy. This is socialism. This is what happens. And that means totalitarianism as well. Um, but is it all bad news? I think they're going to try to do more things. They, they think the reason why the economy is not working properly is because we're not doing enough. So they're going to do even more stuff, which is also not going to work. But that in a way is where the opportunities are. Uh, because already we know that we have a police service that's not working properly, and we have more than double uh, as many uh, private sector security guards than the police. So, in a way, the police in South Africa has been has been uh, uh, privatized. Uh, I'm, I'm working from home. We've got two little girls that are in grade one, and I'm all of a sudden a grade one teacher. Can you believe that? And why? Uh, of course, it happened before the time. But the education in South Africa, standards of education, has completely collapsed. And today, the private Private schooling has become the norm. It's not the exception anymore. And looking at the, the, all the technolo technological tools that are available to do that, I'm, I think that's another opportunity. Uh, what I've also seen around here is where, for example, uh, we've got, I know of doctors that are not allowed, well, they, they can't go to their 
consulting rooms because nobody's going out there anyway. So what did they do? They start little consulting rooms in their own private houses. That is another example. Uh, and people are getting involved in all sorts of, I think that's where the opportunities are. The state is trying to do more things. They're going to do a lot of damage, but they can't because they don't have the capacity to do that. And they certainly do not have the money to do that. And I think that in a kind of a perverse way is where the opportunities are. Do the stuff that the state is usually uh, supposed to be doing. And there are really amazing opportunities. But maybe a last comment is that we, I read this morning as South African Ex SA Express, the airline, the state airline SA Express, has been put in um, the, uh, preliminary or liquidation. And I, I'm pretty sure South African Airways is going to follow the same route. Uh, they say they're going to revive that. I'm not so sure. Uh, so I, I think South African Airways will eventually be liquidated. And that's the thing, you know, why is it that we have to really run into a brick wall? Why is it that we have to destroy everything completely before we eventually take the right decision and that's to, to liquidate these institutions as an as example? So, so maybe many of these decisions that must be taken, like for example, a reduction in the wage bill of the civil servants, that will happen eventually because we've run out of money. The money is finished. So it's not a decision to cut back on the wage bill, it's a practical reality because there's just no more money. So maybe these sort of things will eventually happen. But it would have been so much easier with much less pain if we started taking these decisions years ago when private sector economists and analysts told them, listen, South Africa anyway is not going to work and all these other things. Fix it while you can. Now these sort of decisions, you're not even going to make the decision. It will be made for you because of the practical realities. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Gdavi. It's a very good point. Um, we have another question from uh, Rob Stead. Rob, um, please, if you can ask your question to Davi. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Davi. Uh, Davi, I wanted to know if you have a perspective on uh, the post-corona world and what that does to the global balance of power. You know, the, the superpowers of the world, the USA, yeah. China, Europe, where do you see the future yeah. of power going? Yeah, it's Rob, I think it is, huh? but yeah, it's Rob. Uh, Rob, thanks for that. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting one. Again, I think the best way to look at what the world's going to look like in the future is to see where we were and where we were, where we were on our way to before BC, before the crisis. Uh, well, clearly, there was tension in the world. There was a new form of nationalism, America first, in the case of Trump, is an example of that. The... Um, uh, another example is Brexit is another form of new nationalism. So there was this new kind of nationalism that we could see internationally. Um, and now there's tension because of the virus. I mean, uh, some lobby groups in America are suggesting that the Chinese maybe were instrumental in this virus. I don't believe that they created it in a lamb, but some people are suggesting that. Some people and even some senior politicians in Europe are, are, are pointing fingers to the Chinese and telling the Chinese that they should have been more transparent in terms of the information about this virus. So, so clearly there's a new round of conflict, political conflict that one can see internationally. Uh, so I, this, this breakneck economic growth rate that we saw in China for the past 20, 30 years, that without a doubt is going to come to an end now. In the meantime, there are some very important other uh, changes and forces that are taking place internationally that is also going to have an impact on the balance of power. Things like, for example, demographic changes. In less than 10 years, the Chinese population will start getting smaller. They will go into negative population growth. We already see that in Europe, uh, in many places in Europe, most of Europe, in fact. The Americans are still growing in terms of population, but soon they will get to that as well. It's only Africa where we will still see a substantial increase in population. So that's a very important factor. So I think in future, what you're going to see is more isolation, perhaps more, more tension, political, political tension, much, much less traveling between uh, uh, countries, uh, per perhaps even much less trade. And I think this the past 100 years, we've seen an integrate, uh, integration of world economies. We're probably going to see the opposite of that now. Uh, so, yes, it's probably going to be a more divided country or the more divided world uh, going forward. Maybe it's just a comment about the Americans. Many people are talking about the end of the American empire, end of the American dollar. That is unlikely to happen 
very quickly or very soon, it may eventually happen. Uh, and the reason why I say so is because the American dollar is not the American dollar only. It's not only because the American economy is the biggest economy in the world that we all use the dollar. The American uh, dollar and the American economy is not only the dollar, but they've got a massive, deep capital market behind that. I don't want to get too technical, but if you want to have a dominant currency, you must have things that go with dominant currencies as well. Things like, for example, a liquid and a deep capital market. That's what the Americans got. So the American dollar will remain the dominant currency in the world for a very long time still to come, uh, but that eventually will come to an end as well. So I foresee a more splintered world, world in terms of, of, of politics, um, perhaps more splintered world in terms of economies, and things like, for example, a significant slowdown in travel, we, and tourism and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a new world and I think technology, as we can see in South Africa, will probably be playing a much more important role. And, that, and what is also interesting is that the kind, of techno, uh, the kind of jobs and businesses that are involved in the digital sphere are those businesses that will benefit most from this. Well, businesses that are more in the primary and the secondary industries are probably businesses that are going to suffer mostly because of this significant slowdown in economic activities. So there are a couple of ideas. I just don't know, Rob, what's going to happen. Uh, there's a lot of excitement, and I think a lot of things that we can look forward to, but I'm afraid it's going to be a new place, and it's going to be, it's going to be unfamiliar, I guess. Yeah, I guess so too, certainly. Um, I've got another question um, from Johannes here. Johannes, may I ask you to direct your question to Davi? Hello, Johannes. Johannes, are you there? Okay, that um, I am not able to hear him. Um, I see there's another question from Philip. Probably we can take that first. Philip, would you mind directing your question to Davi? Philip, you're muted. I see. I'm trying to unmute Philip. Can you hear me now? That's it. Yes. That's it, yes okay, Philip. Um, I have to say I value your, your opinion quite a lot and I listen to you often, so that's why I'm bombarding you with questions. I'm looking at this from a micro point of view. Now, I'm, I'm a businessman, as I've said. And I have to build a business and I have to make sure that the business is sustainable in the long run. With all the government interference that you foresee and the problems that might come, is, what, what, is, what would you imagine the risk in expanding and building and investing in this country going forward? You know, there's a, there's a saying in the economy that the higher the risk, the bigger the return. But you mustn't be stupid about stuff. Um, do you think it's still still a viable option to, to expand your business in, in South Africa then with all the changes that you foresee and, and the challenges that lie ahead. You know, I don't want to work myself to death for the receiver of revenue. In the end. I would like to make some profit um, in the long run. Yeah, Philip. Um, <clears throat> now, there are, there are some significant risks here. I know we all know before the time there were some ideological things like, for example, expropriation and and I hear there's a new rumor doing the rounds about the wealth tax. So yes, uh, ideology is playing a big role. We talk about pol our political leaders, and like we've discussed already, is that they seem to be to continue on that specific on that specific uh, path going forward. But having said that, Philip, you know, um, and this is my my previous comment, is that the world is changing and has been changing before the time. And I don't know what business you are in, but the, the kind of businesses that will thrive in future will be businesses that where the people got the necessary skills and in the, and, and in the specific sectors of the economy that will benefit from this world, this new uh, technological world. And I've mentioned technological things like e-trade as an example, or what we're doing at the moment, uh, being an asset manager, that's what I do, for example. But yes, there are risks. I think the, uh, maybe just a comment about expropriation. I think that will go through. We're going to hear about that. We're going to hear about more inequality because there will be an increase in inequality. 
And the more we hear about inequality, the more we will hear about things like, for example, wealth taxes and expropriation and things like that. And there will be an amendment to the constitution and there will be expropriation. But I'm not concerned that much about the state expropriating property as an example. I'm far more concerned about the, the masses just taking over a piece of land, for example, and the police not doing its job. So it's more a case of the, the, the state just collapsing and not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Is there even still, it must be still investing in South Africa? Uh, are there opportunities? Without a doubt. Uh, without a doubt, there are opportunities. And South Africa is just full of opportunities. And the way to do this, uh, depending on your industry, but the way to do this is to identify your risks and to manage your risks. And more than that, I can't really say. But having said that, also, I think part of your managing of those risks will be to diversify your portfolios and make sure that a substantial part of your portfolio is invested, invested abroad. And that's what I do. I take a lot of my clients' money out, uh, but I leave some money locally because it's a nice place to stay, um, wonderful weather, and it is a wonderful country to stay. But watch out. Look over your shoulder all the time because it's the, the risk and the risks are going to get more over time. Thank you very much, Darby. Um, I do have now uh, Johannes's question as well, which I will um, just read out to you if that's okay. Um, sure. And he would like to ask, um, how are the stock markets going to perform internationally and in South Africa after the crisis? <laughs> Johannes, you, got, you always ask the, the complicated, difficult questions. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, sir. yes, the answer to the stock markets. Um, Remember, the financial markets are always forward -looking. The financial markets are always discounting uh, the future. They're always trying to discount. When we first heard, first heard about this virus, the, the financial markets reacted without, without us knowing much about this virus. And it only, the financial markets only waited until we started getting the first pieces of, of real economic data before we saw quite a vicious reaction on the world financial markets. And some of these markets went down more than 40%. I mean, this is huge. So, um, so the markets go down before the actual event, before things really start going, really, as they say, pear-shaped markets really know about this and they've already discounted that to a large Look at the South African RAND. That's an excellent example. And if there are questions about the RAND, I can take that as well. So, so remember, financial markets are always forward-looking. And the financial market will start doing better in anticipation of better times going forward. And when you talk about the South African equity market, as an example, many of the South African companies in fact, approximately 60% of the listed companies in South Africa, 60% of those profits are generated abroad. So when you talk about the majority of profits on the JSE, as example, you're talking about actually international profits. So look at the international environment if you want to uh, evaluate some of these local companies. And they will start doing much better in anticipation of better times going ahead. Um, and we've already seen the markets uh, uh, returning uh, doing quite well the last say, couple of that, well, couple of a week or two, three. Additionally, uh, the especially internationally, uh, the, the the monetary authorities are they busy with experiments that I'm afraid it's, <laughs> it's going to cost us in future, and it's I don't know what's going to how things going to turn out in future. Maybe very high levels of inflation, but the monetary authorities, especially internationally, are printing money like in such massive amounts of money and pushing it into the world financial markets. Now, all this money has got to go somewhere. And somewhere, a lot of this money is going to, to the equity markets. So I must tell you, I'm, if I, uh, uh, especially after the last correction, if I've got a bit of a, uh, an appetite for risk, get a good asset manager and, and start investing in the world equity markets. I think internationally, there are more opportunities than locally. But the equity markets are the place to be. But, but make sure you get somebody that's got his finger on the trigger and make the, to make the necessary adjustments when, when, when necessary. But, but that's one place where, where I really like to uh, put my money and that's in the world equity markets. And, and it's especially in certain kinds of uh, stocks. Remember that the 10 years ago, the financial crisis, it was a banking crisis and it was a bubble, the property bubble that burst. This time now around, it's a completely different crisis. It's not a banking crisis. What we have, we've got certain companies in trouble, but it's not banks. And what we're seeing is a double crisis. It's a collapse on the supply side of the economy and the demand side of the economy. So it's completely different. And, but, but the point I want to make is that certain classes of, of equities that I particularly fancy, and the banks are certainly one of those losses. Mm. 
Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, so we have another question from Lisa. If we have another two, three minutes, um, Darby, just on the recovery of the RAND, as you mentioned, can we expect it? And do we have yeah. any idea when? Yeah. Let me tell you what uh, I've, I did a lot of work on the currency on the RAND. And uh, before I give you the answer to that, I must tell you, I don't know. I don't know okay. what's going to happen on the currency, and nobody knows. So no, let, don't let anybody fool you on the currency. But I've done numbers, and let me give you the numbers. The rand is a hugely undervalued currency. The rand, there are very few times in history where the rand was this undervalued. Now I do certain calculations. I know in, in terms of 19 rand, 40 or whatever, it's the weakest ever against the US dollar. But remember, there are some other variables which you have to keep in mind as well. But the rand has been weaker than this. And it was weekend 2008 when that one, two or three days, whatever, when the RAND completely overshot. So sometimes you do find a market, the financial markets would do things. And I think the RAND is one of those examples. I'm looking at the currency at the moment, currently trading at 833 to the US dollar. So what, what do I think is going to happen to the currency? I think this is overdone. I think the currency is going to come back. The RAND is going to come back. And at the moment, I am eyeing approximately 17 RAND to the US dollar. Remember, I've got a lot of money of my clients waiting in the bank accounts, and I must make the call with to move this money. Now, when we get to 70 Rand, I may change my mind, depending on uh, some other information that we get. But I do believe that it's overdone and short term. On the longer term, there's no doubt. The Rand's going to go one direction, that's where we can come to. But in the short term, this was really an overreaction on the currency. I think it's going to come back. It is, in fact, coming back. And at the moment, I'm eyeing 70 Rand. Uh, I, I think at 17, consider that, depending on some maybe other variables. If it gets to 16 Rand, move even more money out. And we get to 15 Rand, just move as much as you can out. That sort of scenario, I think that's where we are at the moment. Uh, where it is at 18 Rand, 33 dollars, uh, that is really too much. I uh, uh, Maybe also just keep in mind that soon, within the next week or two, South Africa will fall out of the uh, certain indices because of the downgrade. And that will uh, lead to a temporary further weakness in the currency. But after that, I won't be surprised if you see the currency coming back and coming back quite nicely as well, which could be the opportunity to move some of your own money abroad. Where it is at the moment, 1833, I think that's a little bit too weak. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Davi. That was a good outlook. Um, let's see how our currency is, is developing. Um, I do think um, the, that we don't have any further questions so and um, we are closing uh, on the dot at four o'clock that's wonderful thank you very very much Darby for uh, your talk it was very informative and um, I'm sure that our participants enjoyed it a lot thank you for also always being such a big supporter for the Austrian Business Chamber we really appreciate it um, for everybody um, I have Darby's uh, email address here in at the background if you have any further questions or if you like to have a, a you know contact Contact him, then uh, please do so. And uh, now I would like to just thank you all for participating on behalf of the Austrian Business Chamber and thank you very much. Have a wonderful day further. Thank you, Darby. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. you. Uh, thank you so much. Goodbye. Oh, Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.